So it's great to be back with you again for my second talk of the day, which is to discuss some of the themes I developed in the first talk on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and some of the latest thinking, particularly in terms of diagnosis and treatment of cardiomyopathies. So um, this is where I started on the last one, uh, Wallace Brigden's statement about heart muscle diseases. And again, I'm going to pick another quote from that 1957 paper where he said then that cardiomyopathies may be caused by any of the known disease processes and that the term idiopathic should be diminished. And it's actually taken more than 50 years, I think, for us to get to this point where we stop using this term idiopathic, which is basically just doctor speak for I don't know what the cause is, to actually starting to break down these different conditions into their underlying disease groups. Now, I spoke a lot about um, the genetics of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy in my previous talk, and, and I said that in the late 1980s, the first gene was identified for this condition, and we soon learned that actually this only accounted for a minority of cases, and that other genes encoding different components of the contractile apparatus of the heart, what we call the sarcomere, were soon identified over coming decades. And if you bring this up to date, we now have a very complex architecture for the disease of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Indeed, that term, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as in dilated or arrhythmogenic or restrictive cardiomyopathy, they're not really diagnoses. What they are is simply a description of what we see when we take a picture of the heart, for which there are many different causes. And in the case of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we have these classical, if you like, so-called sarcomeric genes, but there are also many other genes that code for different proteins within the cell and other conditions which are sometimes referred to as mimics or phenocopies, such as amyloidosis in older people or metabolic conditions such as Fabry disease, Danon disease. There's a whole long list of these things. So in other words, the, the label hypertrophic cardiomyopathy is the beginning of a story to determine the underlying cause and not the end. And you can apply this paradigm to all of the major disease types. So dilated cardiomyopathy is still defined by the presence of a, an enlarged left ventricle that doesn't contract very well. And there are many different causes for that. And indeed, this table, which I've taken from a, a review article, is sort of constantly reproduced in textbooks, articles, as the causes of DCM, and I actually find this kind of table very unhelpful because it implies that each of these different causes has equal weight. And that's clearly not the case. I mean, you know, without being too trivial, I don't have many people in my clinic with arsenic poisoning, for example. But I think what, what this kind of representation does is it diminishes the role of genetics in dilated cardiomyopathy. You know, we've known for decades that on average about one in four people, 25%, will have at least one other family member who's affected if you go and look for it, implying that there is a significant genetic predisposition. If you genetically test people with dilated cardiomyopathy, as in this study, and there are many other similar studies, if it's an apparently spread case, so there's no obvious history in the family, you'll find a definite or likely pathogenic mutation in a gene in one in four people, and if there's a family history already of DCM, you'll find it in half those individuals. I think one of the intimidating things about the, the, the genetics of dilated cardiomyopathy has been that there's even more genes that have been implicated in DCM than in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Every, pr pretty much all components of the cell have been implicated. But nevertheless, it is a genetic disease in many people. The same is true for arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. Now, now, this one we define in the clinic, it's a little bit more complex because it's not just simply enlargement of, of the heart, in this case, the right ventricle, but it's also replacement of the muscle here in brown by fatty tissue and scar tissue. But the story is still pretty much the same in that if you look for mutations in genes in people with ARVC, you'll find something in maybe 50 to 60% of cases. <clears throat> and in this case, it affects a structure called the desmosome, which is the, the bit between adjacent heart muscle cells, a bit like the sort of cement in a wall, adhering the different cells together. 
And the various components of that structure can be involved in ARVC. But once again, there's a tale of, of rarer but nevertheless definite mutations in other genes. If you go to, if you like, a, a completely different paradigm. So, so I, I come from the cardiomyopathy world. So you know, we're, we're looking at families who have DCM, HCM. But if you go to heart failure more generally, there's been a feeling that actually genetics are not very important in that group. But in this retrospective analysis of two big multi-center trials looking at, in this case, for example, the use of statins, they've genetically tested people in these trials and found, what do you know, that you get hits. And it's the same kind of genes that you see in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, in dilated cardiomyopathy, in ARVC. And indeed, if in these trials you have a, already have a diagnosis of cardiomyopathy, you're 15 times more likely to be able to identify a genetic mutation, which is the likely cause of the disease. This paper sort of snuck out in this year in 2021. I think it's fundamental because it shows that, you know, genetics in people with a problem with their heart muscle is actually not fantasy. It really is a significant problem. I mentioned this in my talk on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. This, I think, is one of those emerging themes in, in the genetics of of cardiomyopathy. When we tend to give talks like this, we focus on what are called rare variants. So if you look in the general population, the variant that we identify in that individual with HCM or DCM is very uncommon. Um, in this instance, this is a gene called ALPK3. This is from, uh, from our own group at uh, UCL, where we've just recently described this as another new gene, maybe about 1% of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The variants are rare. But actually, when you look at the general population and you look for spelling mistakes in the genes, you find that actually quite a lot of people in the population with heart failure and so on have these variants in the same gene. And these are much more common. And we see the same in some other proteins as well. And so we're now starting to see a concept, which is that in some individuals, rare individuals, they may inherit two rare copies of a gene perhaps because each of their parents is a carrier and they have tend to have very severe disease with early onset. You then have this sort of a middle zone where you have a rare variant because you've inherited it maybe from one of your parents and you develop classical HCM, DCM, ARVC. And then there are these common variants in the general population that by themselves don't necessarily cause disease, but perhaps in combination with other genetic variants or other environmental factors, make it more likely that you will develop the condition. So this rather more complex genetic architecture, I think is, is one of the directions we're going in the understanding of the genetics of cardiomyopathy. And indeed, I'm sorry for this figure, it's a, it's a bit like a biochemist's um, <laughs> bad trip, I suppose. But I put this up because th this, if you look at this picture, this is looking at different components of cell function. Look at these little, icons here, BAG3, 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 BAG3. This is a, another protein which is actually important in cancer, but we keep getting a signal in this gene in people with dilated cardiomyopathy, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and it's probably important in many, many different disease processes. So it may be that if you have variants in this gene, it makes you more vulnerable to the impact of other genetic mutations or to having high blood pressure or to having diabetes, etc. It's a term I've started to use this. I mean, it's interesting that you know, the, the, the strap line for this conference is about resilience. Well, I think in cardiomyopathy, it may be that the, the resilience of your heart muscle to, to external insult varies between us because of this genetic architecture. And so being able to describe that genetic architecture in more detail may help us to identify individuals who are vulnerable in the population and hopefully initiate preventative interventions before they develop cardiomyopathy. This was one of the questions at the, in the hypertrophic sec, um, talk about obesity and its relationship with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I mean, people with a clinical diagnosis of HCM, so someone has take, looked at their echo and ECG and says, you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We can see that even within that group, the thickness of the heart changes with your body mass index. 
Interestingly, so do some other things, for example, the prevalence of outflow tract obstruction. And we can explain this in different ways. It may be that maybe the diagnosis is incorrect. Maybe it's the obesity which is actually causing the, the thickening in the muscle. But it may be because you're getting an interaction between these common abnormalities in the population, obesity, diabetes, high blood pressure, and the underlying genetic defect, which makes it more severe in that individual. And again, I think this is one of those areas of, of, in, of growing research interest in all cardiomyopathies. If we look at where we are now thinking about diagnosis and management, you know, how do genetics influence that? Well, I, I use this presentation or a version of this presentation when I'm speaking to my colleagues, cardiology colleagues, um, because I think in cardiomyopathy world, you know, we, 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 we feel passionately about our subspecialty. We try to persuade others that what we're saying is really, really important. But I think sometimes we forget that there is out there a different way of looking at things. And we've got to start understanding the way in which care pathways, diagnostic pathways, and the way in which healthcare specialists think about diagnosis. When cardiomyopathy is diagnosed, it's, as I've said, it's nearly always because of what we see when we take pictures of the heart. So someone presents with breathlessness, for example, and we take pictures of the heart and the way in which we do that has evolved with the technologies that we have available to us. So maybe echo, maybe MRI, who knows what it will be in the future. So we have these very careful descriptions of what the heart looks like. But going the next step and saying, well, what is the underlying mechanism of this disease? Is it genetic? Is it acquired? Is it, a, is it inflammatory? That bit still doesn't work in practice. There is starting to be some convergence between this very descriptive way of organizing the conditions and their treatments and a more mechanistic or what we call etiological way of doing it. So this is from one of my colleagues at, at Bart's looking at MRIs in people with dilated cardiomyopathy and looking for different patterns of scarring and linking those to the underlying genetic cause. So this is, if you like, acting as an early red flag to the fact that if you see a picture like this, first of all, think genetic, and even more importantly, think about the, these one, two or three genes. And indeed, this, this is just to, to prompt me to say this, but we're starting to develop these, these maps, if you like, between different types of genetic abnormality, individual genes and the types of cardiomyopathy we see, whether it be a thick heart, a dilated heart, or a non-compacted heart, you know, there's a sort of complex interaction between these things. And this is probably the way in which our thinking about the classification organization of disease is going to evolve. But fundamentally, you know, when we're thinking about genetics in all cardiomyopathies, as when you do any test, the question is, why are you doing it? And I think we do it to confirm the diagnosis, to help in family screening, and we would like to use it to determine prognosis and prevent complications. I think there's no doubt now that genetics is having a big impact on giving us greater precision in the diagnosis of heart muscle conditions. I've shown this slide several times already today, but in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we have genes in the sarcomere, but many other conditions that can mimic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and we can separate these out, in many cases, simply through genetic testing. And it's important to do so because these rarer conditions have totally different natural histories. So what happens to you if you have Fabry's disease is very different to you if you have amyloidosis or if you have a mutation in one of the classical hypertrophic genes. And this, that we've known in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy for years, this is a classical study from 1995 by Hugh Watkins showing different survivals for individuals with different genetic mutations. And we know that if you carry a genetic mutation in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, you're, you've got a higher risk of disease complications. And what we're starting to do is to separate these out by individual mutations. And this story is also playing out in other cardiomyopathies. So if you take all comers with dilated cardiomyopathy, if you have a genetic abnormality, compared to not having one, then you're a much higher risk, well, you're a higher risk of developing complications, particularly arrhythmic complications. 
But this risk is even greater if you look at specific genes, and in this case, a gene called desmoplakia and one called lemon. So here you're seeing a direct connection between the genetic result and the likely risk of complications. We're seeing this in ARVC. This is um, a summary of a study from uh, one of our own research fellows, Alex Protonotarius, looking at a, an existing score that's out there for predicting risk in arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. And here its performance depends upon the kind of gene mutation that you have. Showing us the future where we're going to be moving towards perhaps gene specific tools for estimating risk. And of course, it's not all about sudden death and ventricular arrhythmias, which is often the focus in cardiomyopathy. It's also about the risk of developing progressive heart failure. And for some genes, my old friend BAG3 that I showed you earlier, some people with mutation in this, this gene are at low risk of developing arrhythmic complications, but seem to be at much higher risk of developing heart failure complications despite treatment with conventional drugs. So as a, as a cardiomyopathy enthusiast, I would try to persuade my colleagues that you know, making a genetic diagnosis is really, really important because it tells you about what's going to happen to that individual. They go, yeah, yeah, that's fine, but what are you going to do about it? How is that going to alter your practice? Because I, as a generalist, I'm only going to pay attention to this when it makes a difference. Because in dilated cardiomyopathy, for example, we know that the conventional treatment with beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, uh, spironolactone, etc., has a, an important impact on survival. These are survival curves from the 70s, 80s, 90s, 2000s in people with dilated cardiomyopathy. And the risk of complications such as heart failure or sudden death dramatically reduced simply by using beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, spironolactone. So what does making a genetic diagnosis bring to the table here? Conversely, in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, as I said earlier, many people will go on to develop heart failure symptoms, but we have no drugs at the moment which interfere with that. So again, how does making a genetic diagnosis change that? Well, the reason that it's going to change things is because, as in other areas of medicine, particularly cancer, understanding the underlying cause is having a profound effect on the kind of treatments that, that we give. Already in cardiovascular medicine, which is a bit behind cancer, we're starting to design treatments informed by the underlying cause of the disease. So for example, for people with high cholesterol, there are within the population maybe two, one in 200 people that are genetically predisposed to having very high cholesterol, what's called familial hypercholesterolemia. And by understanding the the mechanism of that, there are now drugs such as PCSK9 inhibitors, or indeed even gene therapies, which knock down this particular molecule, which can reduce dramatically the amount of cholesterol and improve outcomes. Within cardiomyopathy world, we've for some years been looking for rarer diseases which look like hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So this one, Fabry's disease, I've already mentioned this. This is a rare disease maybe half a percent, one to percent of people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, classically presents with kidney problems, eye problems, a very characteristic rash. But this is important to diagnose because this is caused by an enzyme deficiency that you can correct, you can replace the enzyme. Another poster child, I suppose, for this idea that making a diagnosis influences how you treat is this condition, amyloidosis. <coughs> now, amyloidosis is a condition where you get abnormal proteins being laid down inside the heart. And this can happen because you have abnormality in your bone marrow, where you get excess amounts of antibody being produced, which then deposits in the heart. Or more commonly, you have another protein, a normal protein, which is secreted from the liver, which is called transthyrogen or TTR, that for, for reasons we don't fully understand, tends to break up and then deposit within the heart. We now have drugs that prevent this dissociation, this breakup of this protein, in particular a drug called Tefamidis, which has been shown in a randomized trial to significantly improve prognosis and to reduce hospitalization and to prevent the decline in functional symptoms. And there are now newer therapies that are being trialed, which may, may turn out to be even more effective than Tefamidis, which 
actually stop the gene that produces that protein, transthyretin, from doing so, what we call RNA therapies. We have other examples. This is in the case of dilated cardiomyopathy. Maybe about 5 to 8% of people with dilated cardiomyopathy have mutations in a gene called lamin, lamin AC. And this is an important one to diagnose because it has a very particular natural history. So people present often with atrial fibrillation at a young age. They may develop heart block, and then they may start to develop ventricular arrhythmias, which may cause sudden death. If they survive that phase of the illness, they may then in their 40s, 50s, and 60s start to develop aggressive heart failure. So early diagnosis of this condition is really important because we can intervene with defibrillators, and this has already made its way into guidelines. So early um, implantation of defibrillators is now recommended in this condition. And here, we're also seeing the development of drugs which are specifically designed to treat people with this type of dilated cardiomyopathy. So there's now a randomized trial, and we should know by the end of the year whether there, there's a positive signal in this trial. And this is what I mentioned earlier in, in the talk on hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So, you know, a disease which we did diagnose initially by what it looks like on ECHO book, which has a complex genetic architecture, in some cases caused by mutations that affect the structure, the contractile apparatus of the heart. And by understanding the biology of these mutations and how it interferes with this process of contraction, there are now new drugs which are being designed specifically to correct the underlying metabolic abnormality. One of these, Mavacampton, has been used in a randomized trial to treat people with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and obstruction, showing improvements in obstruction, improved exercise tolerance, reduction in symptoms. And now similar drugs are being used, are being trialed for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and also in dilated cardiomyopathy. And I mentioned this point earlier about trying to correct the underlying genetic abnormality. I've, I've sort of referred to what are called RNA technologies where we can turn genes off or prevent them from being expressed, but we may, or be, may also be able to get replacement gene, if you like, into cells by introducing it using viruses that carry that, the gene into the cell. And there's also this idea of gene editing. You may have sort of seen this. This, this was until quite recently science fiction. And what you're seeing here is it's something which was discovered in bacteria, which is the bacterium's equivalent of an immune system. If a bacterium has been attacked by a virus in the past, it stores a copy of the genetic code of that virus in the form of RNA. If the virus comes back to the bacterium, then this structure, the Cas9 complex, takes that memory RNA, if you like, takes it to the virus, matches that sequence to part of the virus, and then with the machinery of this protein, Cas9, can actually disrupt the DNA of the virus, cutting it and breaking it up. Now, you can use this elegant mechanism in other cells to turn genes off, but also to insert bits of DNA into a gene. So you can actually cut the mutation out and fix it. And this has now been done. It's been done in amyloidosis, um, where that protein that I showed you in the back from a bacterium is used to guide a little bit of RNA to the gene that makes that protein I was talking about, TTR, which deposits in the heart. It's packaged up in a, in a little nanoparticle, which is injected into a vein, travels around to the liver, is taken up into the liver cell, and then it turns off that gene and prevents that protein from depositing in the heart. Six patients, proof of principle, but showing the way by which perhaps in the future we'll be able to edit abnormal genes. So I think, you know, what, are, what is the latest thinking in cardiomyopathy? It's treatment, treatment, treatment. You know, what we would now like to dream about is moving beyond what have been very effective drugs in cardiovascular medicine, such as beta blockers, ACE inhibitors, to a whole new armory of, of treatments, which could be gene therapy, it could be RNA therapies. I haven't spoken about it today, but some of, many cardiomyopathies are probably inflammatory or autoimmune in origin and developing new targeted therapies for those. So a whole new box of 
interventions which can be targeted to specific causes of cardiomyopathy. So I thank you very much for, for listening to this talk. And as I say, I, I think we have every reason to be really optimistic about the future of treatment in all cardiomyopathies. And, and with that, um, I move to answering your questions if I can. So I'm going to do these in, in order of likes on the screen here. Um, so I was, I was waiting for my first COVID question. <laughs> so the first one here is, now that COVID has been with us for 18 months, do you have any data with respect to infection and outcomes for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy patients? So if I, if I take that more generally, um, I think at the beginning of the pandemic, I think there was a, a justifiable fear that people with cardiomyopathy would be more vulnerable to the effect of the virus. You know, it makes sense. We, that many of the things that the virus does uh, by causing inflammation in the heart muscle, by uh, making the heart more twitchy and making it more prone to arrhythmia, by compromising the blood supply to the heart, perhaps by even causing clots within arteries and veins, that people who already had an abnormal heart would be more vulnerable. And I can't say that we've seen this wave of people with cardiomyopathy presenting with problems. But of course, that may be because people with cardiomyopathy were really good at shielding themselves from exposure to the virus. But so far, I don't think we've seen a signal of a specific interaction between the virus and hypertrophic or indeed any other of the cardiomyopathies. That doesn't mean that you shouldn't take all the usual precautions and be get vaccinated, but we haven't seen a, a dramatic interaction between those the two things. And then I suppose the, is, this is an important question. The second one here is how, how are cardiology services responding to the backlog of appointments and what type of service changes might we see in the future? So I think this is one, um, if there are any doctors uh, listening to this presentation, I think they'll immediately start to feel this heavy weight on their shoulders. I mean, this is uh, quite apart from the, the, the personal tragedies that, that have taken place as a result of, of COVID. Uh, this has had a ser serious impact on, on the NHS, and we do have huge backlogs um, in all areas of medicine, including cardiovascular. Um, I think that the, there is a hope that by changing practice, by going to more virtual consultations, etc., that we can streamline the way in which we, we do medicine, you know, be a little bit more efficient than we were prior to COVID. But uh, you know what, I think this is also exposed, and this is a per very personal view, I think it's ex exposed the weakness of our healthcare system in the UK. One of the reasons we had a problem right at the beginning of the pandemic was because we run our hospitals at 99% occupancy. Um, we have too few intensive care beds, too few intensivists. You know, we've run a healthcare service which is too close to the line. And most of the time you get away with it. But when you impose a pandemic on the system, the system comes close to breaking. Of course, we can be more efficient. Of course, we can do things in different ways. But I think as a society in the UK, we have to make a decision about how much we spend on healthcare. And that's not something we can just delegate to the prime minister or to a party. It's all of our responsibility to decide how much do we as a society want to spend on healthcare. Um, and I'm afraid we haven't resolved that. I say that's a very personal issue, a very personal view, but I think it's fundamental to the, one of the key lessons we have to learn from COVID. Um, how can DCM or other cardiomyopathy patients, carers or family members get involved in research studies, trials or surveys to help improve services and care in the UK? Yeah, I think, you know, I think this is one of the aspects of the future of healthcare, and I think that we we have again a strange. I'm being very political today. We have a very strange culture about healthcare in the UK, in that individuals themselves delegate responsibility for their care to doctors, nurses, and so on, and often become passive recipients of advice and treatment. And I think that that people we need to try to encourage people to be much more active in their own care, maintaining their own records, you know, being much more active participants in saying in the type of treatment they receive. And that's that's a piece of work that you know that, that Cardamoth UK does try to promote. You know, it's it's 
informing and empowering patients to be an active participant in their care. Um, the same is true for involvement in research. We cannot do research without engagement and involvement of people with the condition. And I think the work that, that Commonwealth UK are doing and that other organisations are trying to do is to try and yeah, make it easier for people to learn about active trials and to participate. I think this is, this is really important. Um, what is the latest guidance or evidence regarding progression of ARVC, brackets, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy? Um, so in terms of preventing progression, I, I, I think the focus in ARVC has been for a, a very long time on preventing sudden cardiac death because that's the problem that dominates, particularly in the early phase of the condition. And I think we're getting better at that through the development of tools that allow us to characterize an individual, estimate their risk, and then protect their life with a defibrillator. Um, but of course, if you protect someone from sudden cardiac death, they will hopefully live a long time with their condition. And of course, if you live longer with a condition that affects your heart muscle, you then may become prone to other types of complication, and in particular, progressive dysfunction of your heart. And for that, at the moment, we don't have interventions in classical arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy that prevent that. But once again, my message at the end of my presentation about the development of new small molecule therapies or new gene therapies applies equally to ARVC. And there are, are now this research and active um, engagement by drug industry trying to develop drugs which modify the natural progression of cardiomyopathies. And taking what's in brackets in that question, ACM, and going to the next question, you know, does having ALVC differ to ARVC, so arrhythmogenic left ventricular cardiomyopathy versus arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy. So here, honestly, we've got ourselves into a bit of muddle in, in the terminology that we use. Classical arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, um, described until the 1980s, replacement of the muscle by fat and fibrosis in the right ventricle, characterized by arrhythmia. Um, that's sort of, that's a discrete entity, but as we've started to learn, people with that may have involvement of both ventricles, including the left ventricle. We've learned that the genes that cause classical ARVC can also cause disease predominantly in the left ventricle. And as a consequence of this, we've created all these new terms, arrhythmogenic left ventricular cardiomyopathy, a sort of a general catch-all term, arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy, which is, it doesn't refer to one or other of the ventricles. And, and it's become really quite confusing. And I think, I think we're going to see an attempt, I think, to tidy this up. It's going to be quite tricky. But the, the critical thing, I think, is for us to describe what we see as cardiologists, so to describe what it is we're seeing in the left and the right ventricle, and then to ask that question, why? What is the cause? Because fundamentally, what happens to that individual is going to be determined by the genetic abnormality they have, or whether they have inflammation, or whether they have amyloidosis. So the terminology needs to be simplified but the, the diagnosis, the elucidation of the cause needs to be much more sophisticated. So it's trying to marry those two things, better precision in diagnosis, but maybe with a, a rather more rational and simplified approach to the terms that we use to describe what it is that we see when we image the heart. Um, okay, so are there any emerging discoveries about Takotsubo cardiomyopathy? in particular relating to preventing its recurrence and its possible, possible relationships to other illnesses such as neurological diseases. So Takotsubo cardiomyopathy um, is an interesting entity. Um, Takotsubo refer, is a Japanese term which refers to an octopus pot. <laughs> um, and the reason for that is that there is this phenomenon where people under particular stress, and that can be uh, emotional stress, it can be physical stress, it can be the stress associated with um, with a neurological catastrophe such as a stroke or hemorrhage, um, where the heart itself balloons 
and takes on this sort of pot-like shape. And this curious entity is very strange because that ballooning can be associated with symptoms of chest pain and heart failure and arrhythmia, but then it seems to spontaneously resolve and the heart can come back apparently completely to normal. As I say, there, there is clearly a relationship between neurological illness or brain activity and Takotsuba. That, that can be, it can be psychological. So people who have chronic psychological illnesses are more prone to Takotsuba. It can be, it can occur when you have inflammation of your brain and meningitis. As I said, it can occur if you have a hemorrhage or a tumor. But it can occur in other circumstances as well. And another mystery is why it is that it happens for the first time in that person's life when they're exposed to emotional stress, but hasn't happened for the previous 50 years. It's more common in women than it is in men. In the past, we didn't think that it was a chronic long-term problem, but in many individuals, it can be relapse, relapsing. And at the moment, the, the treatments for it relate largely to the use of beta blockers or race inhibitors and so on to try to to reduce the stress component of the illness. But, but once again, as in other forms of cardiomyopathy, it isn't a single entity. So I think the future of Takotsubo is probably, again, trying to define the major drivers to illness to develop new therapies. Um, we've got here, how far off are researchers in finding a cure for DCM, um, especially when a condition is perhaps from a viral infection rather than inherited condition? So in terms of the inherited component, I think there's a lot happening. How far are we from that? I don't know. I mean, I, I showed you that sort of sexy video of gene editing. Um, there are some significant challenges to be overcome in gene therapy. So how do you get gene into the heart muscle cell? That's actually really quite a hard thing to do. But there are, there's a lot of money and a lot of effort, and a lot of brain power being invested in trying to find ways of correcting the underlying gene defects. And that then offers the potential for a cure. The, the condition, the, the question about viral infection, I think, is also important because there, is, there are three probably elements that account for the majority of dilated cardiomyopathy. Genetics is one. Viruses in some individuals is, are probably important. And the third is inflammation. Uh, autoimmunity, which may be triggered by uh, another factor, for example, viral infection, or may be completely unrelated to an infective agent. And whilst i think we've got much better at, at characterizing the genetic architecture we still probably have to do better in detecting virus and also in detecting and characterize information the good thing is if we can do those things then there are already existing drugs and compounds that can treat individual viruses and also treat autoimmunity so i think it's better characterization of those two things which is represents additional treatment frontiers in dcm um, I have a question here, is, is, is aspirin still considered safe and effective for someone with DCM? Um, yes, I mean, aspirin in that context, why is it being used? There's no real indication for the use of aspirin to treat DCM itself. But for example, if someone's also had coronary disease or if they've had a stroke or for some other reason that they need aspirin, then there's no particular reason it can't be used in diet cardiomyopathy. A uh, profound question here, what are the long-term effects of COVID? Well, again, there's a lot of money that's now being poured into the research for what's called long COVID, because it does seem that uh, for some people who've had COVID, they recover from the acute illness, but then are left with the syndrome of chronic fatigue, pain, etc. Um, and it's not clear of the mechanism of that. And, um, for me, that this it's really important to get to the bottom of that, but we see a similar thing. We've always seen something similar in people with some types of cardiomyopathy. The, the previous question about viral infection, for example, it, it's not unusual to see people that have a viral infection present with dilated cardiomyopathy and then are left with exactly those same symptoms. Recurrent bouts of chest pain, fatigue and breathlessness, often provoked by physical exertion, and this sort of post-viral syndrome can last for six months, eight, 12 months, 18 months, often for a very, very long time. Um, and we, just as in COVID, we haven't really got to the bottom of that. And I think this post-viral syndrome and its relation to cardiac function uh, 
is a Cinderella area within cardiovascular medicine. And perhaps COVID will shine a light on this um, indirectly by looking at the effect of other viruses. Um, question here is, will my son who has avogenic cardiomyopathy be on medication for the rest of his life? It, it depends on, on the nature of those medications and the type of arrhythmogenic cardiomyopathy. So if it's for arrhythmia, the answer to that question is probably yes. If it's because the heart function is, is also a little bit down and he's on ACE inhibitors or beta blockers for, to try to protect the heart muscle, again, the answer to that question is, is likely yes. Unless it's a transient mimic, if you like, such as inflammation, most of the therapies we use are, are lifelong. Um, do I, do I have a category for those who are allergic to pharmaceuticals or wish to be treated naturally? Um, so allergy to all pharmaceuticals is, is an extremely rare thing, but of course individuals may have allergies to particular drugs. And we always try to find alternative drugs in that circumstance, but sometimes there is a compromise, unfortunately, in what people can tolerate. Uh, the, the treated naturally bit, um, I mean, Remember that a lot of drugs are derived from natural compounds. So to my mind, um, this, this natural versus drug is an artificial separation often. Um, I have no problems if people want to augment conventional medicine with, with complementary medicine, but remembering that particularly for some herbal remedies and so on, these are often drugs. They may be derived from a plant, but they're a drug. So if you're going to use anything like that, it's really important that you discuss that with your GP or your cardiologist or your, your doctor uh, to make sure that there's no potential harm from interaction between one of those remedies and something that you're already being prescribed. Um, okay. <laughs> now, who, who sent this question in? Looking at your diagram, it looks like pro-autophagy was part of a cell maintenance. Sorry, the picture on my screen is not very good. Would it be helpful for someone with cardiomyopathy to do intermittent fasting? Oh my gosh, to maximize autophagy for healing. I have no idea to the answer to that question, but autophagy is, is a process within the cell by which it sort of tidies up sort of broken proteins and debris within the cell. And that process may be one of the final common pathways to cell dysfunction. And some of the genes that, are, that cause cardiomyopathy may disturb that, if you like, housekeeping within cells. But whether fasting helps that, I have no idea whatsoever. <laughs> um, and then, can hypertrophic cardiomyopathy be linked to endurance training marathons? Yeah, this is an, 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 an important question. So exercise itself can, in certain circumstances, thicken the heart a bit. That uh, tends to be in individuals who are elite athletes. So it's not kicking a ball around three times a week, playing five a side. It's in you know, endurance athletes, or particularly athletes who combine both uh, strength uh, with endurance training. Um, but that, that's a different kind of phenomenon. That's what we call athletic heart syndrome. Training itself, exercise itself, does not induce a hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. The, the problem is more in the differential diagnosis. Where training and exercise is important, of course, is if is in the potential to cause harm if you already have cardiomyopathy and the risk of complications. And there there's been a change in thinking recently in that we no longer bar everybody with cardiomyopathy from exercise, but the prescription for exercise does need to be individualized to the, to the person's condition. Um, in the final two minutes, I'm, I'm, if I may, I'm, I'm going to skip the link between cardiomyopathy and POTS because that's quite a complex answer. There is potentially a, a link between those two things. And there's an emerging uh, syndrome, I think, between POTS, which is a, a particular neurological problem where you get fast heart rates if you stand for too long, mitral valve problems, floppy valve, and probably also a heart muscle condition. But maybe that's one for another time. Um, what can I get from each of these? Some of these, are good, uh, because I'm in a political mood here, I'm going to opt out from some of these final ones. Um, but I think I'm just going to close with sort of a positive word on, on cardiomyopathies again. So I think, as I'm going to keep on saying, we know a lot now about all heart muscle disease. We've got more to learn. But I think we're starting now to get greater awareness amongst the public, greater awareness amongst healthcare practitioners.
And even more importantly now, we're getting a lot of engagement from the people, the companies that make new drugs and new therapies. So I'm really optimistic that we're going to see in the next five to 10 years, new treatments for all of the different cardiomyopathy subtypes. And I would encourage you to you know, keep taking an interest in your own condition, keep putting pressure on your doctors, keep putting pressure on society more generally to, to keep a focus on changing the lives of people with these diseases. Thank you very much for your attention.